Welcome to the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin, your source for real estate investment jewels of wisdom. Welcome to the REI Diamond Show. I'm your host, Dan Breslin, and this is episode 178 on how to find off-market real estate deals with Zach Booth. If you're into building wealth through real estate investing, you are in the right place. My goal is to identify high-caliber real estate investors and other industry service providers, invite them on the show, and then draw out the jewels of wisdom those tactics, mindsets, and methods used to create millions of dollars and more in the business of real estate. Before we get into today's episode, I have an announcement of my own, I guess more of a request. As you probably already know, my main business is buying and selling houses through Diamond Equity Investments, the house flipping company that I founded and run. In 2020, we bought and sold 283 houses at an average profit of $28,817 per deal. This represents 56% growth in profit year over year from 2019. And with all this growth comes more opportunity, maybe for you. We are currently seeking a new full-time acquisition manager uh, in Atlanta, Chicago, and Philadelphia, uh, who is interested in joining the team and quickly closing a large volume of deals. We have plenty of leads, plenty of capital, and absolutely the best training and support in the business. Currently, those positions, the positions we are looking to fill, are in Atlanta, Chicago, and the Philadelphia market. Uh, yes, you must live local to that market in order to actually work out for the position, but uh, full details about the position, the responsibilities, and income expectations can be found at www.dealswithroi.com slash careers. Some of my best business partners to this day have actually come through listening to this podcast. Maybe you're the next. So back to today's episode, we have Utah real estate investor Zach Booth joins us today to discuss how to find off-market real estate deals. And one of Zach's secret weapons is his highly efficient marketing list. Well, I guess it's not actually a secret now that he's shared it on the show. Let's get rolling. All right. Welcome to the REI Diamond Show, Zach. How are you doing today? Doing fantastic. Thanks for having me. Sweet, for sure. So to give uh, listeners a little bit of background about you, where are you recording from uh, is that the market where you invest? And if not, you know, which markets are you investing? And like kind of what was the origination story to, to get wherever you were before to like where you're at now in real estate? Yeah. So I'm actually here in Utah, my home state where I grew up, love the mountains here and uh, probably always at least have a house here. And um, I'm investing here, have my wholesaling company here, my main branch. And we just opened up a new market in Florida about uh, two months ago, and we've got four deals there already. So we're pretty excited about the expansion. And nice. uh, in regards, yeah, so that's been pretty fun. So we're doing real well uh, with wholesaling and, you know, getting into real estate. I was, I was originally a window washer uh, for a long time, actually. And I was, I, you know, had a pretty good business with it. But it wasn't where I wanted to be. And I was, I, I was living paycheck to paycheck. I had some debts. I was constantly risking my life. And I wanted to get into, win, uh, into real estate investing. I had read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Um, and I started listening to some podcasts and reading some books. I got all excited. And so I spent 10 grand on a coach. And not that I, I never did a deal from that coach's advice. I never got a lead from that coach's advice. He would give me my money back. It was a complete nightmare, and I felt so discouraged. I gave up for some time, um, had some uh, huge blessings happen, wonderful things happen in my life where I realized that people do trade convenience for price, and you can be successful. So I got the courage, got another mentor, and started doing deals. And this wasn't until um, April of 2017, I did my very first wholesale deal. I had done some real estate, very little. Before then, but I really went full time. I walked away from window washing. 
Um, and with the, within a year, I was, you know, writing a $50,000 check, paying off my debts and traveling, um, to Alaska and, uh, you know, taking my wife to Hawaii and just having, um, having some true financial freedom. It was pretty amazing. So nice. That's kind of the backstory uh, for me. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds pretty cool. It's, uh, it's interesting or it's a shame, I guess. Um, the, the 10 K wasted on the coach. I mean, was it a matter of the coach really didn't know what to tell you to do or was it like a lack of implementation there or was it, you know, the wrong person who was in that position? I'm just kind of curious because we hear a lot of people who come on the show. They heard good stuff. Well, well, not necessarily come on the show, but certainly in the real estate investment community, uh, where you know what to do and you didn't do it. That, that really doesn't strike me as, as you though, Zach, you're swinging from the side of buildings, getting the job done. I mean, guy must not have knew what he was doing well i mean i don't i don't mean to be negative towards anyone and maybe it was me maybe i wasn't a good fit for him um but you know i can tell you the one main thing is he would say don't worry about getting a cash buyers list just spend some money on marketing and um so i did i spent a lot i spent i signed a thirty thousand dollar contract put most of it on a credit card uh with a company that was supposed to get me leads um that he suggested not only did i not get a lead i got nothing i mean just nothing it was so so upsetting so not only did i pay for the coaching i paid for this garbage marketing and even if i found a deal i wouldn't have had a buyer you know and i learned from my new mentor and i've seen this over and over if you've seen undercover billionaire uh the guy that goes out and tries to turn a hundred dollars into a million dollar company in 90 days you know the first thing he <laughs> does is he's flip flipping junk and he says, the first thing you do is you find a buyer, right? Even him, he knows, right? You find a buyer first. And so I did get bad advice from that first mentor. Yes, I did get bad advice. Um, and also the other thing that I understand deeply now to my core is, is business um, is built around a marketing channel. Build a, a business is built around producing leads. It doesn't matter the industry. Um, but real estate investing especially is marketing. Um, I was reading a book. This really changed my perspective. I was reading a book called Undercover Millionaire. Or not, sorry, not Undercover Millionaire. Um, uh, multifamily Millions is what it was called. And he's talking about giant multifamily syndications and giant deals. And he says if, if um, real estate investing is marketing, and if you can't get that between your two years, you will not be in business for long. And it really helped me realize, like, wow, how true is it then for wholesaling and for what I'm really trying to do? Um, and that was that was the big game changer. Like, that was that was when I went from doing a few deals here or there to really realizing what I needed to focus on, and my business exploded. I went from six figures to a half a million in that in that one year. Yeah, I think I could agree with you wholeheartedly there. I, I think like, you know, sometimes people ask me like, well, hey, what do you do? Like in the company, I'm the founder of the president titles, right, of Diamond Equity Investments. Um, and, and like the true answer is, you know, I'm like the marketing guru guy. Like I spend my days, nights waking up in the middle of the night, writing ideas down that have to do with marketing, right? It's like who who would think that, oh, Dan Breslin hosting a podcast and talking to Zach Booth. Uh, is a, a critical component of the business. But in some piece of what I do here, this is kind of the media where I communicate with my audience. And there's people in my audience, Zach, who end up joining my team and becoming business partners. And like tr truly for me, a big part is finding the right people, uh, you know, for, for the right role to really succeed at a high level. But like the people never would know who I was without the marketing opening the door. Um, you kind of answered yep. the question a little bit with the marketing being the big lever that's kind of moving things forward. But like, what is the heart and soul, the real true, you know, uh, nuclear pellet of, of the reactor that is uh, your business now, Zach? So, like I said, I believe in marketing. I believe that um, that's the core of, of my success so far. And, and, and the second component is what you said, which is building a team right, to to service those leads. But if you don't have leads, you can't service them. So what really changed everything is, is I was I started doing some deals by marketing to uh, motivated seller lists. And they're basically Excel spreadsheets of potential uh, motivated sellers you can get, that you can buy or you can get from the city, things like the tax delinquent list, divorce list, um, code violations, um, high equity people that have owned the house for a long time, 
uh, people to own the house but don't live there, so absentee owner. And I was doing a few deals. That first full year of full-time real estate investing, I did just barely over $100,000 marketing to those lists. And then the first two months of that next year, my business was really struggling. I did one deal, and I was I was running out of marketing money. I didn't know what to do. I had a family to provide for, and so I had to find a way to find leads. And so I started looking like what's a like what's a difficult list to pull? Like what's a what's a barrier of entry that not everyone can do? Like what's something that I can do to change where I'm at? And I learned about something called driving for dollars, and um, so I just started driving around and writing down addresses and looking it up on county records, and I f- found some success. Um, and then I started digging into it further, and I found out there's some apps that you can use. You can add properties crazy amounts really fast. You don't have to look them up on county records. Um, and I started really pushing that marketing channel and perfecting it. Um, and by the end of that year, like I said, we had done just shy of a half a million because of that marketing list. So it was it was a game changer. That is, uh, that's interesting. And it's, it's funny to hear you say that. There's a couple other people I, I, um, have heard around who say like, you know, what's the most valuable marketing list for any real, uh, real estate investor or wholesaler? And the answer is your, your own house list that you've compiled, you know, through driving up and down streets, time, time, whether you paid someone else to do this, upload the, the photos, uh, whatever it is, but you know, there's the list that no one else has, right, Zach? Oh, 100%. It's huge. I mean, and the, 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 there's so many reasons why it's the best list. I mean, like you said, you control the list. So I have a student, Michael McLeish, um, that he, he had a decent business in South Carolina in Greenville, and it was about $300,000 in 2018 that he had done. And his list that he was buying from listsource.com was no longer going to be available because of some privacy law changes. And so his business was going to go to zero. He couldn't pull the list anymore. And so, you know, he didn't control the list. So essentially he lost his business. And luckily he found driving for dollars and, you know, now he's crushing it with that marketing list. Um, but, but yeah, it's so, so important to have a marketing list that you control and to have that in-house list. It's the most inexpensive way to start. Um, it's scalable, you know, because just like with, um, let's say, a code violation list, right? The city's only going to write so many code violations. And if you want to do more marketing, you got to go find a different list and hope and pray that that one's profitable, you know? And so if you get, you have the code violation list, you can't just ask the city if they go add some more. But with driving for dollars, all you got to do is pay someone <laughs> to, to drive a few more hours, you know? Yeah, it's it's by far the best list. You know, I, I told you I I had done a half a million um, or just shy of a half a million by the end of that year. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm motivated to do more and continue to challenge myself. It's not just necessarily the money. And so I, I, uh, was looking for the next year's goals. And this was back in about November of 2018. And, um, I had a friend named Matt that invited me to do a self-help journal called Living Your Best Year Ever by Darren Hardy. And in that book, you create or in the first hundred pages of this journal, you create three big goals for the year. And it talks about whatever your goals are, you have to give away what you want to receive. So I wanted to bring in a million dollars. That was my goal. I had no idea how to do it. I felt like I had tapped out my driving for dollars list. I had no idea how to do it. So um, I knew, though, that I had to give away a million dollars. And I didn't have the money to give away. So I thought, hey, why don't I just teach my driving for dollar system to a handful of people? I'll hand select people that I already like. And Michael McLeish was one of them, you know, and a handful of others. And I said, let's let's teach them what I'm doing to put that kind of money in my business and let's see where it goes, right? Let's see, let's see if this book is legit or not. Like I'm gonna test it. And um at the end of that year, we did one point two million dollars and I didn't add a different marketing list. That was all from driving from dollars. And it was because the more I taught, the more I learned, the more I, the more I taught, the more questions I got that I had never even thought of in our, in our system, what it is today evolved. So it's pretty, pretty amazing experience. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Congratulations on, uh, blasting through that goal. It's so good to see them set. And then, you know, the progress you make towards them and the, the modification and the detail tweak, nuance, et cetera. So dive a little mm-hmm. deeper with me into that uh, for a moment. So you mentioned 
that the driving for dollars list was like a, a little tapped out, if you will. So yeah. you started this other thing. Can you talk about maybe the structure of those partnerships or the, the people you taught? Was that how you built your team? Was that in your city or other cities? Or, or did you find a way to scale even further your driving for dollars list in the Utah market where you already were doing business? Yeah, so my wholesaling mentor had become a friend, and I told him what I was trying to do. And so he he gave me a few people that may be interested, and he allowed me to to reach out to a few people on his Facebook group. And and I just I just found some people that that I maybe knew from other uh, wholesaling groups or other um, uh, training and coaching programs I had been a part of. They were co students or whatever, and just just found ten people. It only took me about a week. Um, and I truly just picked them just to put money in their pockets. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't a self-serving thing at all. Um, other than I, I was testing the book's theory that you had to give what you want to receive. And, um, so I, it was, they were just truly students and they're, they're friends of mine to this day. I respect them a ton. Like, uh, one of them, one of them, Scott, he's actually coming out to fish with me this weekend. Um, but, you know, that happened and, and the big change, like the big shift, some of the big shifts were, were I'll give you some examples. Like um, my criteria, my driving for dollars criteria was, you know, just the really bad ones, just the boarded up ones. <laughs> and, you, you know, just just the the nasties, the completely obviously vacant. And I was I had someone driving probably 30, 40 hours a week. And they were only adding about 500 properties every single week, you know, and that was, you know, I didn't feel like I could add more properties than that. And then what we started testing is like, why don't we have like an A list and a B list? The A list is like really bad ones. The B lists are the not so bad ones. And, and we went from with the same amount of time driving, we went from 500 to 2000 properties um, to test it because the questions I got from my students. And then all of a sudden we went from, you know, a deal a month to four deals a month. And, you know, it increased our cost per deal um, by like a thousand, five hundred, thousand, eight hundred bucks. But our average deal size is close to 30 grand. So it wasn't like it was that big of a deal. Um, And, you know, that was one of the big things. And then the next thing that I I had made a shift in is um, I started redriving um, each of those areas every six months. So I started making some major differences and I, and I started deleting everything that I had added six months before and just doing it over again. So if they, you know, wow. I just continually, yeah. So there was some major adjustments and, and, and shifts and it's because they challenged my, my opinion on how to do it. They said, well, why is that? And it's like, if I didn't have data on it, I'm like, oh, you're right. I probably should test it, you know? And then there was also a bunch of just stu- stupid mistakes. Like one of them was like, Hey, Zach, when you have your tracking phone numbers, how do you make sure you're getting text messages? And I'm like, huh, I don't know. Maybe I'm not getting text messages. I had like a hundred thousand dollars worth of deals just sitting in my, um, in the call center text. because it wasn't getting put. Yeah. Text. Cause it wasn't pushed to my CRM, like wow. embarrassing mistakes. You know what I mean? And so like, it, it was just, it, and still to this day, still to this day, as I coach my, my students, um, I learn. I learn, I learn, and I get it. I get to help negotiate deals, and I get to see deals. And, and you know, I haven't been in this industry very long, but I get to do so much more than someone that was just going out and trying to do it on their own. Like I, I get an inside look at every market aco- across the country, and it deals with unique situations and problems, and it's it's so fulfilling. Yeah, that that's interesting. I do like very large marketing. And, and one thing that you probably are experiencing when you went from the A, A list only being horrible to the B list and then you're quadrupling the size of your list is you do kind of pick up this, uh, you know, this further. I kind of like to think of my mail as like I'm making a deposit into a marketplace. And I've been in like seven markets around the country. I'm currently in three. Uh, we pulled out of Florida. We just, there was too much competition for us. And, you know, we did our, our lucky deal every now and again. And, and maybe it was the team. Maybe it was the market. Maybe it was our marketing style. Um, it sounds like you're off to a running start. But I think of the mail, like these deposits and like I've built up this, you know, kind of brand equity. I mean, it's really hard to have a brand in, you know, in our, our line of work, but, you know, more so that I've put millions of letters into these marketplaces where over time, People are hanging on to the letter. They're calling like they saved. I sent a postcard in 2019 and I get like 
multiple leads off this one postcard, July of 2019. It was like a, a big campaign to like all the whole house list. It was huge. Um, but you know, the higher records sometimes do add to the cost per deal, but it, it also has this like long term effect. And so if you ramped up, I'm not sure when it was, but if you ramped up last year, the mail, like there's this also ongoing snowball rollover effect that continues to occur where these like one offs that hung on to your letter because the timing wasn't right, they end up circling back around and not taking away anything from the laser targeted approach. I'm I'm probably sure that the money we're spending on all that uh leads could could have been better allocated had we driven these areas, you know, consistently the way you're talking about, as opposed to kinda inconsistently uh how I'm talking about. It. So, so do you do any of the other kind of big dumb marketing lists like me, Zach, or is it a hundred? You know, I just driving. For- I, I just started radio. I just started radio. So that's a big dumb list, in my opinion. I'm dumping a ton of money into it, and and I and I don't think that your strategy is wrong. I don't think that that dumping a ton of money into these big generic lists is a bad thing. It's just the problem is not everyone's set up financially to be able to do that. Very very few are. Right, you kind of have to work your way into that position, and where I spend most of my time coaching new people, right, people that really yep. want to be successful in this. And so, like when I when I was trying to be successful, I was a window washer. How does a window washer, you know, get set up to where he can spend twenty, thirty grand a month in marketing? How do you do that? And so, I had to have something that I could start small that was laser focused and then expand. And that's, that's what happened with driving for dollars. And that's why I love it so much. You know, not everyone's going to start off being a, you know, being a Dan. And, and so, it, and, and neither it, did I. <laughs> right. And so how did, yeah, how did you get started? Like, how did you, how'd you come up with those initial funds? You know, and like for me, driving for dollars is how I did it. But how did you do it? So back in, you know, 2006, initially there was like a a newspaper ad I got lucky on and it was a few hundred bucks a month and it generated enough leads for a business. And eventually the market crashed 2008, 9 and 10. And like my listeners already know this, but I had like struggles with drugs and alcohol and I've been clean for like eight years now. So, you know, do the math. 2012 uh, was when I finally was able to kind of shed all those bad habits. And I sort of had to like restart over again, like like not only just real estate, but like life, like, you know what I mean? Like I kind of screwed everything up. Uh, but right in 2012, 2013, I mean, I'm down to like no money all over again during that period. But uh, I would mm-hmm. buy a roll of stamps, Zach. And I remember like going through the newspaper, the physical newspaper, not online at first. And I'm like reading the obituaries. And this is how I was like compiling a sort of a probate list, doing research mm-hmm. into public records, and, and cross-referencing and then mailing them out and writing them by hand, printing the letter out, signing them, the whole thing. Uh, and I lucked wow. out and did a, a few deals in there, you know, and, and luckily, like, from before I had uh, some connections around the real estate network. So, like, I had a, a buddy who was a, a flipper who had funded deals for me in the past and we kind of, you know, joined up and he would do the rehabbing and I would kind of handle the marketing and that, that partnership ended up, you know, growing, growing further. But, uh, that was that was kind of the early days was was that right and there was like whole houses you say like twenty thirty thousand uh you know per deal like in two thousand thirteen two thousand fourteen it was hard to make money the market was not conducive like it is now all across the United States for making money number one because the values were so much lower people were buried under debt tax debt. mortgage right. debt they were just buried under the debt in the property so now you had at least some um some price inflation since then. So we're, we're like in a really lucky, unique market where you can do these deals at, you know, uh, 20 and 30 and $40,000 spreads. Uh, you were lucky to make, you know, two, five to $10,000 on deals in, in 2013. But I would flip whole houses and put that a hundred percent, all of the money made on a flip and like put it all back into marketing. Like I've done that a whole bunch of times over like a whole bunch of times to get to the point where we're at, uh, where we're at now and we're blessed. Well, I love it. And I think that's so cool for the audience to hear is like your story is not much different than mine. It took a whole hell of a lot of hustle and determination and grit and writing hand letters. And that's how I did my first driving for dollars too, was finding a really ugly house and writing a letter and putting the stamp on it, 
my saliva and getting the paper tuck cut on my <laughs> tongue and sending it out, you know? And so I, I love that. Right. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, that that's what it takes is it, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of grit. And a lot of people just see these big old fat checks that people are bragging about and, and they think, Oh, I can do that. And they, they, they send a thousand dollars worth of mail and they go, Oh, this sucks. It's a scam. <laughs> it's a sham. You know, it's like, you gotta want it. And I have some amazing students that want it and they find success. And it's, it's so fulfilling to watch people go through that. It really is. Yeah. And I, I gotta be honest, right? So like when I first saw, I, I can't remember where I saw it, the booking agents who got us together, or it was maybe on your webinar. It's like, oh, uh, driving for dollars, DFD, like master me. Ah, uh, driving for dollars. And I bet. Right. I want to take a moment <laughs> to congratulate anybody listening right now. You made it this far because a lot of people think, ah, driving for dollars. That's that newbie stuff that like, they're, you know, the coach is telling you just go drive for dollars. And it's like a bunch of nonsense. And the real meat and potatoes of the business is, you know, radio commercials or huge amounts of mail or this or the other thing. But like, man, you got two options a lot of times when you get started. Like you and I were talking about our our early, you know, low money budget kind of days um, and having to use that grit, hustle, determination, ingenuity, right? And we're bringing what also is kind of expensive for, for a lot of people they don't recognize, but the value of our time. So early on, you and I had more time to bring to the table, so we had to find a way to invest our time wisely and correctly to maximize the limited amount of budgets and then you grow later on to a place where you know that time can be replaced with money and now all of a sudden it's huge budgets on you know radio on tv on um on you know facebook ads and on um the list goes on anything you can do to market billboards bus stops bus the back of the bus um you know there's a whole plethora of like mass marketing things that you can learn how to invest the the money instead of the time but early on you know to be able to do like i did where i was selecting these obituaries to put myself in a position where there was a probability of a deal being done because someone perhaps didn't need the house any longer since they had passed on um the same way that you kind of did it and are doing it with the driving for dollars thing there's an investment of time in selecting this highly probable list of like real estate investor targets. And like, quite frankly, no one's willing to do it. Most people probably have the same, you know, gut reaction I have when they hear, oh, this is the driving do for dollars things like what? Huh? No way. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. Is that just my perception there? And it probably cost me a bunch of deals because, you know, my, my team also, we have the app set up and we do the driving for dollars thing. And, you know, we're supposed to do it on the way to our appointments. But it's a whole lot easier a lot of times. Just run out on the appointment, make the offer and keep it moving instead of opening your eyes, driving around the block a few times and entering some addresses. I mean, what's your feeling on it, Zach? Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. I hear I've heard this a lot. Right. When I when I go talk to successful investors like, oh, driving for dollars. Like, what are you talking about? Like that that's for new people. Right. That's that's not scalable. Right. Because traditionally driving for dollars took a lot of time. But with the new apps and the systems that, that, that we have now, it doesn't. And one of the biggest mistakes that especially, in, um, you know, successful investors, right, already established businesses make is exactly what you just said. They give responsibilities of driving to people that shouldn't be driving, to the acquisition manager, to them themselves. Like the the ultimate goal is yes, if you don't have the money to hire a driver, you do it yourself. Sure, fine. But once you you have some money, once you've generated a deal or two, then you hire someone that stays consistent to adding a specific amount of pins every single week. And what I mean by pins, like houses to your to your list every single week so you have consistent deal flow and then it's just like any other list where you you know you grow it to the biggest you can where you're driving your entire market every six months and you have one person that just does that and you have you actually have a master map with where where you drove when you drove there and it's all color coordinated and that's what we have so like it's not just something for new people it's actually something that can be scalable um so, so yeah, man, it's, it's, it's a list that can be taken advantage of, but the biggest mistake is hiring someone on a commission basis to do this for you or to have someone from your team and take away from what they, their main responsibilities are. You should just hire someone that focuses on just adding properties and that is their goal and their expectation.
Nice. Uh, what market are you in, just so I can get a little bit of perspective? In Utah? Yeah, Salt Lake City. So we go everywhere from uh, Logan, uh, which is north in Brigham City, all the way down south to Provo. Do you know? Do you happen to know like the metropolitan population of that area? Yeah, that entire space is about two million people. Okay. And and you, this is a market that you feel like you were covering this already at some point and getting up and down nearly every street, or do you feel like you have maybe forty percent of this? Like, what percentage of that market? Just to give people around the country an idea of like, oh, would this work in my? 400,000, you know, person area, do I need to be in Atlanta where I've got 5 million? You follow me? Yeah, yeah. So I, I have a, we probably drive 30 to 40% of it, meaning um, that's about the neighborhoods that make sense for us, um, where, you know, the housing prices, there's, there's quite a bit of higher end housing in Utah. It's a very wealthy state um, for the most part, you know, where, like, for example, Tampa, like I look at the potential of Tampa with how many lower end houses there are um, and the amount of population. Like, I feel like I could, you know, I can do a million dollar company here with driving for dollars. I feel like I could do two, three million dollars a year out of Tampa. Um, but, you know, if someone's worried about the size of their market, if you have someone wholesaling, has a successful wholesaling business that's serving them where you live. Guess what? If you took this driving for dollar system and did it where you live you could be successful as well. So, I mean, I have successful students like um, Jared Frankham. He lives in Lubbock, Texas. I think it's like 200,000 people it's all. And he's doing really well with it. Um, So you don't have to have giant markets to make this work. Yeah, and I ask that because a lot of times the big dumb marketing lists for data, um, I I shouldn't call them big dumb because we make a lot of money from them and they actually do work. It's just expensive to do it. And it feels more evolved to have. Like, I, I wish I could just, like, I don't know, invest the twenty, thirty, fifty thousand, whatever it was, right? And like, instantly have the driving for dollars list that you described uh, without all the management and oversight of actually collecting it. I want to buy that list, right? It's just it's not available. Well, the the, um, the thing, it's not just a list. It's it's a constantly evolving list, like. Like I said, we redrive every six months. The beauty of this list is constantly being refreshed every single week, um, and we only market to that list for about three months, and then we spit it out, throw it away, and start again. And it's and it's because you know when someone when someone has a problem, like let's say you you know you're having to deal with shitty tenants, like all of a sudden that tenant now has couches on the front lawn and has driven the truck up on the front lawn as well and caused ruts in the lawn when a month or two months before it was fine. But when you drive, drive it again, you're like, aha, here's the moment. So we actually add um, new properties at about a 20% range. So let's say, and then we add the rest about 80% of them. So we, we keep about the same amount of addresses, but, but we pick up about a 20% difference where, where, you know, we're getting rid of 20%, but we're adding 20% new in each neighborhood. And that that newness is what's making us so successful. So it's not just refresh, something that you buy. Yeah, when you refresh yeah, when that re- list, Zach, do you guys like uh-huh. literally drive and, and you happen to select the same 80% and then you find another 20? Or is there a process for keeping the 80% there and you, you are adding additional ones and only through time like popping them off? You know, like if somebody rehabbed it, is someone having to manually take that off or – do you happen to go select all the same houses again on the sweep of the neighborhood? We we add all the same properties again because it's just so much easier just to delete mm-hmm. it all and start it again and just just physically identify <laughs> them. Um, so that that's that's our process exactly. That's pretty cool. What are uh, what are some of the B list? Um, characteristics i mean are we talking like newspapers piled up out front is it just overgrown gardens you know what's the short list yeah the short list is just like one small thing like maybe some peeling paint on the fascia just any physical sign of neglect right where the a list is like the lawn super long newspapers piled up broken window boarded up window like the you know you can totally tell that there or maybe there's like a tarp on the roof as well like really bad houses, we put them on the A list. Like, yes, if this thing sells, it's going to an investor. Um, 
Um, and, and we actually don't have the A list, B list anymore because we tested the data and we're profitable off of both. So it's all in the same. What I'm tracking on my KPIs right now is how profitable is my driving for dollars list broken up into three sections, which is the corporate owned list and the absentee owner list and the primary residence list. And so we've been testing that for about six months now. Any results so far? Lists. Are they are they all comparable? They're, they've all been pretty comparable. The the owner occupied in Utah is very high. Like because you know we I'm now going to see the data in, in Tampa and dude, there's way more rentals in Tampa. It's crazy. So owner um, owner um, occupancy is way higher in Utah than a lot of markets across the country. So that's just our biggest list. And a very small portion of our list is corporate owned. So, you know, we're only spending like $1,000 a month on the corporate owned list, where in Tampa, it's like completely reverse. You know, like we're spending like 50% of our houses, where only like 10% of our houses, um, sorry, 50% are, are, are absentee or, or corporate owned, where, where we're only like 10% are absentee or corporate owned here in Utah. Yeah, I think I, I remember. I remember I was in Tampa and I was also in Miami, and we would see kind of that same thing where there's like a dramatically huge number of absentee sellers. And I used to live in Tampa, and so there's like a big vacation home, humongous vacation home uh, ownership in the entire state of Florida, where people up north want to go to Florida. Uh, they come down from Canada, in Miami, they come from Europe, they come from Russia, they come from South Amer America, like in droves to Miami. Um, mm -hmm. But but so, so some portion of the absentee is going to be your vacation home and your second home. And so what I find mm -hmm. is that the absentee in Florida does not behave like the absentee, absentee, absentee list in Philadelphia, Chicago, Atlanta, or other markets where they're like standard rentals. Um, and I'm sure it's an mm -hmm. evolving market too with the advent of Airbnb. People are, uh, are certainly going to have, uh, you know, uh, absentee ownership on those Airbnb vacation rentals. It's, it's, it's a really unique market that way. I'm glad to hear you're uh, you're you're kicking ass down there in the Tampa market so far, um, Zach. Let's switch gears a little bit and just touch on exit strategy. Do you ever fix and flip? Do you hold rentals? Do you wholesale everything? Are you double closing stuff, or is it assignments, or are you just hoarding houses and keeping them? Yeah, so I probably eighty ninety percent of what I'm doing right now is wholesaling. Um, I was acquiring till about a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, I had about eight rentals um, that I picked up, um, a lot of them through subject to financing and things like that. Um, but what happened is is the in inflation happened, right, and it's happening uh, here in Utah so much so that the 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 cash flow just didn't exist. There was there was, I mean, I could buy a house for two hundred fifty thousand dollars and three hundred thousand dollars, and it rents for twelve hundred bucks, and it's like wow. Why, why would I ever hold a rental here ever? I mean, and so I just sold all my rentals because if it doesn't make sense to, uh, to pick up a rental, it doesn't make sense to hold a rental just because the, the return's ridiculous. And I, and I expect some type of, you know, correction as far as our inflation here in Utah. Um, just like California and some of these crazy inflated markets. Um, but, uh, Florida, I'm planning on, and that's kind of why I chose Florida. Uh, is for the beach and then second for the potential for cash flow <laughs> and acquiring um, and actually having cash flow, you know, actually having something to pay the mortgage with after after I collect rents. So. Yeah, and there's something to be said. I, I can't remember. There was this magazine that came out like in 2008 or 2009, and I was so excited to get it. It was like um, the it was like the quality level of the Rob report. If you've ever gotten that, comes in a plastic bag and the whole thing. Uh, it's kind of like the Bigger Pockets also put out a, uh, a real estate investor magazine that I subscribe to. Pretty decent information in there. Um, but this one came and went, right? It was like the it was like as the bubble was popping, this magazine I can't remember the name was on the cusp, and there was this great article in there, and this guy had like his Maserati or something on the pages, and he said, "Now here's the wealth principle." Uh, that, that, you know, this is what it all boils down to. He's like transfer, like transfer creates wealth. And so the big takeaway that he was that he was making in the article that I took, at least, and it's like a, a rote, you know, uh, part of the ritual now is like 
transaction transactions creates wealth, the buying and selling, right? And I have some rentals yeah. and that, that was never my game. I'm sure there's people listening who make tons of cash off the rentals and totally love them. I always find like my rentals are like barely breaking even at the end of the year. They're paying down mortgage and they're doing some tax things. And I like that. And the, the uh, properties are going up and I like that too. Um, but ultimately like the focus on, and we were just talking about this on the last episode, the, the focus on the cash generation machine first and foremost. And so if that's you, Zach, with the wholesale, and if that's me with the, you know, flip and retail, a little bit of wholesale, um, if that's a fix and flip investor who's really good at doing construction, they can pop off four, five, six, you know, decent flips, keep the budgets in there and, and sell them off like you did with the rentals to the people for 250, 260. Uh, and just, I don't know, there's just something about that, like, it's working. It's not the rich dad, poor dad, total freedom from the rat trap. But like, for me, that's really what took me from being broke to having money to then be able to invest in some rentals. This thing was get good at generating cash by closing a high volume of transactions. It's like my battle cry, do many deals, like close as many deals as you possibly can. The only cure or the best cure for the bad real estate deal that you are in right now or that you're going to do at <laughs> some point down the line is to mitigate it with a high number of deals to come behind it to put yourself like, you know, in the, uh, in the raffle, if you will, for doing like a home run grand slam of a deal. Um, and with that, why don't you share maybe the details of uh, a home run or grand slam of a deal that you've seen throughout your uh, day, Zach? Yeah, I've had a I've had a couple, but when you were talking, it actually reminded me of this deal. I was I was actually going to tell you about. It. It's funny you asked me. So, um, you know, you, you would ask me what are some of the other ways. So I do traditional wholesale, but I've recently uh, this is a great gold nugget for those that are listening. What I found is you know these these cash buyers are very interested in buying my deals and they're fighting over them, making highest and best and bidding it up, um, but they're still making twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars on my flips. And so I thought, I wonder if someone would be willing to pay that that highest assignment fee where I get a lot of money and then split the profits on the back end and take all the risk because I hate <laughs> flipping houses. I hate getting hard money loans. I hate managing contractors. Every time I've tried it, I make less than if I would have just wholesaled the damn property, right? And so um, I've wholesaled as well. I like that where I close on them and list them. I don't do a dang thing to them. Maybe a maid service, maybe. Um, but... Uh, so what I found is I found a partner that has a ton of experience investing um, and, or flipping. He has his team lined up. He can do three, four houses a month. Um, so he could do the volume that I wanted. Um, and he also has private money lined up with amazing rates. So he has a lot of control over the financing as well. And so what he does is he pays me my full assignment up front. So I keep my cash flow. I take no risk, and then he gives me a 50% equity on the deal. So whatever profits he pulls, um, I get another 50% of the flip profits. So it's amazing because um, I'm not taking a dime less than I would have if I would have just wholesaled it, but I get more on the back end. So I've got a deal right now in the hopper that we've cashed out our assignment fee, um, and we made $70,000 flat on that assignment and then we're going to get we're we're actually closing on it. We're going to get an additional twenty five grand on the flip, um, on our our portion. And the reason we made so much more on the flip than we thought is my acquisition manager had a a, a lead in the follow up for over a year, and they said, well, we would sell it. But we just need something bigger um, than what we we're in now, but we need it at this price point. But it so happened that this flip met that criteria, so. We didn't have to pay an agent because we already have the buyer that's mm. buying this one. We're buying their fixer upper and we're going to make about $45,000 off of the other house we're buying by wholesaling that one. And I think our flipper is going to take it, maybe pull another 10, 15 grand out of that flip as well. So it's going to be a, a very, very sexy, close to $200,000 deal when it's all said and done um, between those two houses. So pretty awesome stuff. Nice. Let's touch on the motivation of that partner. So like, you know, at first hearing it, right, Zach, I'm kind of like, ah, man, you, you know, this this guy, if I was the guy flipping the house and I cut you to $70,000 check, I'd kind of be looking at you a little sideways. Now you want 50 percent more. And then when, when I do all the work, take the risk of the market, et cetera, I assume that I'm going to make 25,000 and I'm handing you another 25, like 
aren't I getting the short end of the stick? Like, what's the value proposition for that partner that you made uh, where it makes sense for uh, that partner to take that kind of risk and do that kind of work? Yeah, so he gets to go in and evaluate every single one of our wholesale deals. And if he evaluates it and says that there's no profits, if he paid that assignment fee, say, no, assign it that guy. That guy's that pay that guy. I wouldn't flip it for that. But then he gets to go, yeah, I would match that highest offer. There's profits. So the the bonus for him is he gets an inside track to all my deals. He's the only person that gets this, right? Plus, he, he guarantees that he can pick up flips. He doesn't have to worry about deal flow anymore for his construction company, essentially, right? And he keeps his private money working, right, which is what his private money lenders want. And so for him, he continues to make money um, by having deal flow. And, and, you know, what basically what he's up against is either he can go out and hustle and um, do his own marketing and do his own lead flow, and he wouldn't need me anymore, and that would be fine. But he doesn't have to do that. He guarantees that he has flips. Even though he may make less per flip, he gets the volume he's going for. So that's the bonus he gets. That's why it's worth it to him. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what if there's a loss on the deal? And I'm, I'm kind of asking all these details and peeling the onion. So if anyone's listening, like, hey, this is a great idea. Let me pitch my guy so-and-so. I kind of wanted to bring all the details out, if you don't mind. So if you lost money or he lost money on a deal, it went in the opposite direction. Do you have a zero risk or is that something that you would backstop with him in the interest of the? How about that? I have zero risk. I have zero risk because um, our agreement is, you know, he's the specialist. He pulls the trigger. He's the one that knows his numbers. And I'm not a I'm not a construction guy. I'm not a flipper. I don't know hard money costs. I don't have his private money connections, right? I found the deal. Do you want to match this cash offer and give me 50%? Um, you know, in, in, in the case that there is a sour deal and it goes bad or something happens, I may make it fair in the next one and may make him pay me a little less on the, on the assignment up front or something. I mean, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a complete jerk. My, my goal is to keep good relationships alive. Um, but it's, it's been a, a good, a good gig. This is, this is our fourth deal with him. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Sounds like a solid, uh, contact. Great idea. If anyone's listening, uh, to implement yourself, if you happen to have the deal flow, um, cool. I got an eye on the clock here, Zach. I realize our time is getting late. So let's switch gears a bit. Uh, let's talk about books. Do you have a book or two? that you recommend most often, maybe one book recommendation that you'd make to like you or students who are probably a little newer in the game. And it may be a, a book recommendation you might make to me who's been in the game for, you know, five, 10, 15 years. Doesn't have to be real estate related. Yeah. Um, man, there's, there's so many amazing books. Uh, one of, one of my most favorite books uh, for this industry of wholesaling is never split the difference by Chris Voss. Uh, the hostage negotiator for the FBI. Uh, that book's amazing for for this business. Yeah. Pretty much all of my negotiation tactics come out of that book. Nice. All right. Any others? Oh, of course. Yes. Um, if you want to understand more about you know cash flow and uh, evaluating you know multifamilies that kind of stuff, multifamily millions is an amazing book. And then. Another another great one is Traction. Traction is a great one for building a business and um, understanding the six pillars of your business. Sweet. Are you uh, planning to or starting off into the multifamily, the larger multifamily asset class? Not in the foreseeable future. Gotcha. And if you could share, share the crown jewel of wisdom, Zach, with your younger self, what would that be? Um, I would say... Uh, I would say spend less time hustling and more time educating yourself. I, I I spent so much time working crazy hours and doing all the door-to-door sales myself, building my window cleaning business. And, and I had this limiting belief that Tony Robbins helped me overcome. Um, I had this limiting belief that I was stupid and um, I needed to uh, hustle because I didn't have the brain. And uh, it wasn't until I started listening to books and reading and um hiring mentors that I realized that I have a different, I have a different way of learning and it wasn't the traditional education route. I struggled in traditional education, um, but I've really excelled by having mentors and hands-on 
um, hands-on experience with mentors critiquing me and reading books that were um, that were in the realm of what I wanted to know. So that's what I would tell myself yeah, is, is education. I've I've found the same thing to be true for me. Like I uh, I gave up on college after a year and a half, and you know I did okay in school, uh, but it's so much more fulfilling. When I'm reading, studying, talking, listening to podcasts and educating myself on something that's, you know, going to make me wealthy at some point that I'm highly interested in, as opposed to like calculus. Um, right. How can listeners get more info on uh, on you, Zach, or maybe driving for dollars mastery? Yeah. So you go to REI dfd.com so like standing for real estate investing driving for dollars so rei dfd.com and on this website i'm actually giving away a full blown uh wholesaling course so i paid 10 grand for that first wholesaling course like i said and then 9 grand on my second wholesaling course uh the $9000 one was way worth its money right it got me going and i believe that this wholesaling course i'm giving away for free is actually better than both those courses. So check that one out. And then also you can apply to become a student. I do limit the amount of people that I bring on as students because, um, yes, there is like an information product and course material, um, but I also do do a weekly support call um, and I do spend time with my students. I actually print out a picture of all my students and put it on my wall um, and I know who you are. And so for that fact, I do limit. So if you want to book a call and apply, I would love to talk to you and, and see if we're a fit. Um, so you can go to that website. Also, there's links for all my social media there um, in that website as well. You can check it out. Sweet. And don't you have something coming up on YouTube people should probably go check out? Oh, yes, for sure. So this is this is something I'm really excited about. I was up late the other night. I couldn't sleep because I was like, how do I inspire more people to go for their dreams? Like, How do I show people that they can do this um, and they can be successful? And so um, I, I had this kind of crazy idea uh, that kind of uh, came about because I had watched Undercover Billionaire. But I'm going to take a thousand dollars, and I'm going to go to a new market. And the goal is to turn that thousand dollars into forty grand in forty days. I'm going to have a film crew follow me and document it all along the way and share that on my YouTube channel. So that's going to be. I'm actually flying out this January 12th. So that'll probably be on my YouTube channel uh, towards the beginning of 2021. Sweet. Maybe we'll have you back like, uh, you know, March 2021 and we'll, we'll get the, the low down and pick apart the details again. But uh, cool. Yeah. Sounds like fun, Zach. I, hey, I had a good time. Uh, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. I had a blast. For sure. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, it's been, been fun for me as well. Thank you. Off market real estate deals. All of us real estate investors covet that rare profitable off-market real estate deal, often bought with very little competition. The problem is many investors futilely try to develop their source of off-market deals through real estate agents or wholesalers, only to become frustrated when they discover that they are not the only buyer in that real estate agent or wholesaler's network. The only real way to have a consistent source of off-market real estate deals is to develop a business of attracting those deals. Uh, enter the REI Deal Machine, originally developed as a resource for high-volume investors to build teams of drivers who are literally driving their market looking for rundown and distressed property the REI Deal Machine simplifies the process of route tracking, lead generation, and literal push-button marketing to allow you to focus on the highest value skill set a real estate investor can build, and that is negotiating profitable real estate deals. For a limited time, you can register for free access to the REI Deal Machine at reidealmachine.com. You'll have a chance to play around with the system, take a demo, and actually begin using the app at no cost. So go register free right now at reidealmachine.com. And thank you for tuning in to this episode of the REI Diamond Show. Please remember to review and subscribe on your podcasting app. 
just search REI Diamonds and click subscribe. If you're interested in receiving my weekly big idea email, where I provide the most valuable jewel of wisdom I discovered during the week, you can sign up at www.reidiamonds.com. You'll also find the 177 episode archive at that site. Again, reidiamonds.com. So in 2020, my house flipping business, Diamond Equity Investments, bought and sold 283 houses. Well, mostly houses. A few were apartment buildings. Anyway, we have 114 more in our inventory. So here are three ways we might do business. You and I might do business. Number one, are you interested in having access to the best real estate deals in your market? In other words, access to deals that you can buy at low enough prices to actually profit after renovating and reselling? If so, go now to www.accessrealestatedeals.com. Number two, are you an accredited investor who enjoys double-digit returns? If you'd like to potentially invest passively in one of my real estate deals or many of my real estate deals, go to fundrehabdeals.com and sign up to receive my private mortgage investment opportunity emails. Number three, of course, I am always buying houses that I can flip and occupied apartment buildings with below market rents. So if you have a deal that fits that description in either Atlanta, Chicago, or the Philadelphia region, please shoot me an email with the details. We are at the conclusion, my friend. Next up, how you can make $300,000 per year investing in mobile homes doing nothing but no money down deals. Catch you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin. To receive email notifications of new weekly episodes, sign up at www.reidiamonds.com.